Hello and welcome back to the FVZ show. We have had the two Rome e -Pris and boy, what a thrilling encounter. Both races were rain. We had it all mixed up grids, crashes, failures at the end of the race. We had everything in Rome. With me to break it down today is the one and only Jack Pickering and Edward Hunter. Boys, how are we this evening when we're recording this? How is it? Rome, what? Just what a race. <laughs> I'm um, I'm still trying to work out which one of me and Ed is, is the uh, one and only. But uh, yeah, no, it, it was a uh, it was a fantastic uh, it, uh, it was a fantastic weekend uh, uh, full of everything, basically everything you want, every, everything you'd want from a typical Formula E race and some rain, which we don't usually get as well. So so, yeah, no, it, it, it was a good weekend. Yeah, I think Norman Nato would have wanted not to be disqualified, personally. <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, um, as for the actual race, yeah, I had a great time. Uh, the, I'm more I'm more mustache than than Ed at the moment, so I apologise for that. But um, so yeah, anyway, so uh, I'm I'm looking forward to talking about it because there's, there's a lot to unpack, as they say. There is a lot to unpack, and the first thing I want to talk about is is Mercedes. Let's talk Mercedes because Stoffel van Dorn, you know, put that thing on pole position, you know, and we're looking, you know what, Jack, like, Mercedes, they were really good in that first race, we're thinking, oh my god, right, they're on pole, they're dominating, you know, we're looking like we're starting to get a favourite, and then Formula E, do Formula E things, and this is not Formula E, it's just how crazy Formula E is, is let's talk about this collision between him and Andre Lotterer, now, Andre Lotterer, again, someone who we thought, you know, Porsche, Interestingly, as a side note, look, they look kind of interesting. You know, they're kind of quick, but then kind of not quick at the same time. So we'll get on to them in a moment. But Andre Lotter alongside Stoffel van Dorn after qualifying, they go into, I think it's turn seven. Oh, I can't remember exactly what turn it was, turn seven. But, um, and then bang, right? Lotter just dies down the inside. And then all of a sudden, bam, van Dorn's into the runoff area. Pole position seemed to be the jinx. We'll get onto that for race two as well. The jinx of, of of Rome. But Jack, what did you make of that collision Van, uh, with Van Dorn? And because Van Dorn has actually got a little bit of stick for for that for that move. Yeah, it was it uh, it was an interesting one. Um, and 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 it was so early on to the race. I I I thought someone of um uh, Andre Lotter's caliber would be would would you know just sit sit there for a bit. And then decide to pounce on, on uh, Stoffel. But uh, yeah, it was it was basically the third breaking zone of the race, um, uh, which he decided. Yeah, I'm just gonna have a little punt, um, punt on the inside of Stoff when he wasn't really alongside or anything at all. So um, uh, so yeah, no, I I'm. Yeah, I think Lotterer did deserve that penalty. Um and yeah, it just kind of set Stoff and uh and uh, Lotterer back and to be honest that uh, to be honest the first few laps of that race I I, I think was basically a, it, it was it was a sin to uh, lead the Rome Prix in the first four or five laps but um but uh yeah, uh, uh but yeah, an interesting one and I think that kind of put pay to Mercedes day from there. Yeah, Ed, what do you think? Because Van Dorn was criticised for sort of closing the door or sort of, you know, you know, Lotter had gone for a move and instead of just sort of admitting defeat and go, right, I'll get you later, you go through right now. You know, people were saying Van Dorn, even though Van um, Lotter had got the penalty, that Van Dorn closed the door and, you know, made it more likely for, you know, the crash to, to occur. What do you What do you make of that? Well, there's two sides to every story, apart from the stories about me, in which case there's only one side, and that's my side. But anyway, uh, we're talking about Lotterer and Van Dorn here. Uh, from Lod What Lotterer said was that uh, Van Dorn broke really early, and that he'd sort of turned it into a move. What Van Dorn said was that he didn't, he thought it was like really early into the race, and that Lotterer made a really risky move where there wasn't really room and uh, put his nose where it shouldn't have been and it all came to grief and to be honest i agree with van dorn to be honest there was no reason for lotterer to take such a risk so early in the race when the track was still slippy down at turn three which is effectively the first sort of breaking zone so i i'm kind of with van dorn i think uh, he was right to feel aggrieved i think van dorn did very well to actually rejoin uh 
as, as and, and, not, and not lose time. Lotterer lost like the whole half of his front wing, I think. So it was very easy to tell him and Verline apart from the rest of the race. Uh, so yeah, I, I think Van Lotterer got the penalty for that, and I think it was uh, very deserved. He went on to have uh, two pretty messy races, to be honest. So then, obviously, Mercedes race go from bad to worse. But again, Jack, before we go on to talk about you know how their race ended. You've got to give De Vries and, and Van Don some credit because they came back through the field and, you know, Van Don was 14th after that collision and he's ended up back in like 5th, 6th place by the time, you know, his race comes to an end. So for me, that's got to, you know, show that this Mercedes team, this Mercedes car is quite competitive at the moment and then we'll move on to the collision now. In terms of Degrassi, poor Degrassi, you know, begins to slow down. And he takes avoiding action, goes over his manhole cover, manages to smash into the wall and also take the freeze out at the same time. It just was one of those days, one of those Formula E days for Mercedes in in Rome. Yeah, I think I, I think the saying is it, uh, uh, when it rains, it pours or, or, uh, or, uh, or something like that. And that's more or less what happened to Mercedes that day. Uh, they were taking out the lead and then both of, both of them taking out the race by... Oh, it, it it was so unlucky because I I think um, Lucas um, has had, had such a di- he had such a difficult season last year. It was the first year that he didn't win a race, and to see him back at the front fighting fighting for the victory, it was fantastic to see. And for him to have that um, uh, failure with about five minutes to go. That that really really sucks. I really want to see Audi do well after they had a so so last year, um, and so yeah. And then that was difficult. And then Van Dorn. I mean, like there's 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 not really much you can do in that situation. Van Dorn tried to go around the outside, went over the manhole cover, and and it was curtains basically. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just one of those things in the end, but. Um, yeah, I, th- I think disappointing. Just disappointing in total. Yeah. Um, Ed, in terms of Mercedes then in, you know, obviously the way their race ended, like, it was it was just heartbreak. And you can feel for the team because th- this championship, we don't know how long it's going to be. And, you know, with the points being, you know, chucked away potentially from that, from that Saturday race, you know, it hurts because, as I said, they look like they have the pace. Yeah, they certainly had a strong recovery up to that point, and it's it, like like Pico said, it was one of those things. If um, if um, Degrassi had had the failure maybe at a different point, uh, uh, maybe a bit earlier in the race, and the Jaguars had come upon before they'd gotten past both Mercedes, it could have been it could have played out very differently, and maybe have uh, taken both Jaguars out. But as it happened, the Mercedes were there. Van Dorn. Like you say, lost grip on that manhole cover. There wasn't really much that even Mercedes driver could do. You can maybe argue that De Vries could have got on the brakes a bit earlier, but he didn't really have a lot of time to react, I guess. So, yeah, it was just horrible luck for Mercedes and for Degrassi as well to have that. I think it was a drive shaft failure, and he had it with like uh, just uh, two minutes, three minutes left of the race to go or something like that. Uh, so, and it couldn't be restarted again. So, we got uh, we, the race started under the safety car and it uh, ended under the safety car. So, we got to see. That nice shiny new mini uh, electric mini that Formula E are using at some of the selected rounds uh, this season. I got a fair bit of it as well. In fact, uh, we didn't get to see the starting grid in either round because the conditions didn't really allow it, and it was something that the drivers uh, complained about, about, and they wanted to move the start, but there wasn't really practical. There wasn't really time to do that, so we ended up, uh, like I say, starting and ending under safety car in uh, race one, uh, race, round three rather. So yeah, that was that was interesting. And Mercedes came off first. What really surprised me was Gunther had a crazy moment just after that, where he basically managed somehow to avoid everyone, uh, had a half spin, hit the rear tail light, kept going again, banked a few points. I was very impressed by that. <laughs> yeah, the Gunther the Gunther slide and the spin was uh, was it was an incredible one. But yeah, just wow. Degrassi just can't catch a break. Like the mechanical issue, you know, it reminds me back to his championship season four when he was trying to, you know, uh, retain that championship. And Audi had the best car um, in season four. Like I know Tech Cheetah was strong as well, but Audi were just as strong. And the way that Degrassi was able to fight back in that championship, I remember in that first four races, he was having just terrible luck from 
decent positions and you know it, it was just reminiscent of that Degrassi back trying to win a race and then all of a sudden those gremlins creep in at Audi again and they had a really interesting they had a terrible weekend and let's stick with Degrassi we'll just jump to race two very quickly because Degrassi Jack was involved with um, a collision with Sebastian Buemi which you know the replay sort of showed Degrassi maybe coming into Sebastian Buemi and saying that it was dangerous and, and so forth and you know it was a silly maneuver but then commentary were like ah maybe Degrassi turned in on Buemi and there wasn't really giving much Buemi you know much um much room to do anything so Pico what was your take on the Degrassi and Buemi um, accident from race two so as far as I'm aware um Seb Buemi was in attack mode at the time um and so he and so he was trying to go down uh, he was trying to go down the inside of um Lucas and yeah Lucas went over for a defending move uh maybe it was a tad too late and you know like front nose into like tail tail light kind of thing it 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 wasn't a hard um collision between uh Seb and Lucas um which I mean, like the amount of times that we've said that over the years as well, it's disappointing. I think, um, I think Lucas was being a bit OTT on the radio because I remember that he said in he said over the radio, "Old oh, Buemi deserves a penalty for that" or something, uh, something along those lines. Um, I maybe uh, I I I don't know which way. For me, it was kind of fifty fifty. So I uh, I think it was I think it was a racing incident, anyways. Um, so yeah, it's um, so yeah, no, it was. I mean, like to be honest, uh, the the amount that happened here over the course of the weekend, this was just the small little thing in in the end, just this accident between uh, Buemi and Degrassi. But um, after that, uh, after the day before where Degrassi was odds on to win, I I I think, I think he was a little bit um frustrated by that and so I think he channeled a little bit of frustration into that in the second race as well. Yeah because Audi had a horrible day um, as well because obviously Rene Rast who was coming through the field hit the wall and then span out was just hit the suspension failure that he suffered from that so a, a day where it was going to be so, very much like Mercedes um, in the first race where you know it was looking stronger you know Audi had a chance of collecting points and they end up not collecting any points and you're just there like, ah, Audi, you know, so much to show. They believe that their car is so strong, Audi, like Anna McNish Degrassi says, the car's good. The car is good. But that's Formula E. And the team that have been picking up those pieces right now have been Jaguar. And that's, the, in, in my opinion, Ed, that's the aim of Formula E. It's not about having the best car. I never think having the best car helps. And I think Tech Cheetah have shown that because they have had the best car. But Tech Cheetah have also had the fastest car and have been consistent. And I think consistency is huge in Formula E. And yes, Bird, we can talk about, did get caught up in an incident um, at the end of the race, which took about. But again, that consistency for the team's championship, just being there and, you know, for picking up second and third in that first race ahead for Jaguar and again just more points you know they're not the fastest okay but they're they're there or thereabouts but they're in that position all the time so far this season they were in it in Diria they're just picking up those pieces and pick points mean prizes come the end of the season yeah absolutely I think I actually think Sam Baird was a little bit unlucky the race the first race on Saturday ended when it did because I think Vern was actually looking kind of vulnerable potentially at the end there Jaguar were doing a really good job on energy management and I think the person that really surprised me over the course of both races was his teammate Mitch Evans who was able to finish behind him in third on the Saturday and then on the Sunday had a great recovery drive through to I think about sixth or seventh I think in the end I'm pretty sure it was sixth with all the penalties applied so yeah I thought and Mitch Evans just really rocketed through to um, second in the championship right behind Sam Bird so the points table doesn't lie Jango have a pretty big lead at the moment and uh, they're in a much stronger position than we've ever seen them in Formula E before so it's looking like from what people are saying it's going to be a Jaguar Mercedes to Cheetah fight for the championship the way it's playing out at the moment so fingers crossed we see uh, some fireworks yeah I think that's exactly what we're going to see actually because Jaguar have been fairly consistent you know I think we'll get those odd Porsche results we'll get those odd you know other teams maybe BMW, maybe Audi. I don't think you can count Audi out. I think Audi will get a, a result here or there. It just hasn't fallen to them um, 
this way. But yeah, Jaguar, Mercedes, and Tech Cheetah definitely look um, one of the strongest. And you hinted at it there. Vern ended up winning this race, taking advantage of Lucas Degrassi's penalt uh, penalty powertrain failure. Um, but if we just think more broadly out of the whole weekend, Jack, and the Vern, the new, the new powertrain, because obviously Tech Cheetah brought their new powertrain for season seven. Um, in Rome, so they didn't they didn't debut it in um in Diria. But I know they're saying that they didn't have a lot of running in the rain, but it didn't look like they'd made a huge step forward. I still feel like even with their season seven powertrain, the difference so far doesn't seem massive compared to their season six powertrain, maybe performance wise. I don't know if you would agree with that sentiment. Yeah, I yeah I do kind of yeah I do kind of agree with that. Uh, yeah, it's. It's an interesting one because I think that obviously we didn't see the best of the uh, the best of the powertrain this weekend. However, I think that's maybe because, um, and and actually kudos to Vern for winning that first race because at eight, eight hours beforehand that that car was in bits stranded on the opposite end of the of the circuit. So, I mean, for for from them to go from that to race victory is um. Is uh, is quite astounding, and 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 I'll be honest. When I was watching, I was thinking, could the powertrain have suffered some damage from that? Because because it was a big impact between um, him, uh, Oliver Turvey, Jake Dennis, and I believe I think Alex Lynn got a, a minor bit of contact out of that as well. But um, but uh, yeah, I, I I think I think for Ch uh, for Cheetah, I think they've had a solid weekend. Um, yes, that yes, that second day wasn't um ideal in the slightest but it was still it was still a decent it it, it was still a decent haul of points for the cheetah and it shows that they are definitely in the in the um in the uh, championship oh cuz obviously qualifying doesn't help in a wet on a wet second day so that makes it like a, a, a mixed up grid um but Moving on to the second race, obviously qualifying was completely mixed up. We had the rain. The rain had come down. It wasn't really predicted. Like even at the start of the weekend, they were like, oh, there's like a 10% chance of rain um, that we might get. But boy, did we get rain on on the Sunday. And qualifying was mixed up and Cassidy took the pole position with, with a great lap. Obviously, the track was drying out, but that super pole session for me, I feel like the conditions were fairly stable because... Like Maxi Gunther went, um, or Max Gunther went for a lap ahead, and then was two seconds slower, but then someone else went, but you know, behind, and then was much quicker than someone behind him went just a bit slower. Like it was, I feel like it was not as the move, move, movement between the track evolution was not as high um, as Super Pole as maybe we think. But obviously Nick Cassidy on pole, his first pole of the season. But then we have to just keep this story rolling. Because he goes into that turn three and it rear brakes lock up and you think, oh, Cassidy, he's been on fire. He's been on fire. He's going to do it. He's going to be the first rookie to win for like, you know, come into the championship, win in his first couple of races. And then bam, he locks up. He's at the back of the grid race pretty much over. First, Ed, what was your you know thoughts on Cassidy getting pole? And then what happened in the first lap of the race? Yeah, well, the pole lap was truly superb. Uh, I wasn't sure about your Indian weather forecast accent there, Jack. We might edit that out. Uh, but, um, but anyway, I didn't realise I did one. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure what you were going for there. Jack, in answer to your question about Nick Cassidy and uh, his brilliant performance in Super Pole, it was great. He it was wet, sort of drying conditions. He judged it really well. Everyone, I think, most people sort of thought Van Dorn was going to get pole again, but he didn't. Cassidy outfoxed him and scored his... As finishing on pole he got three points so that's his first points in formula e but then beginning of the race like you say it was looking so good for him uh locked the rears uh there was some kind of weird kind of software issue it wasn't entirely his fault because he wasn't the only one we saw nick debris make the same mistake a bit later in the race as well with uh, very dramatic consequences uh twice actually uh but um but, but yeah it was uh really unfortunate for cassie he did get going again in 10th and then oliver roland who'd been Looking to take pole uh, for the first race, round three. In round four, he qualified really back down the grid and was fighting with Cassidy for the final points position. And they ended up making contact. Cassidy went straight in the wall. Roland got a penalty as a result. And uh, yeah, that was that was uh, all she wrote. Really, Cassidy got going at the back end. So it was it was very frustrating for Nick Cassidy. It just sort of there was this kind of 
uh, I don't want to say roller coaster effect, but that's the only word that really comes to mind. It was sort of he made one mistake and it sort of compounded all the hard work he got to get into that really strong position. So I mean, Cassidy's really good. We've seen it before in other championships. I'm sure he'll be fighting for the front again. It won't be his only opportunity, but uh, in the end, uh, Envision Virgin having to rely on the efforts of uh, Robin Frines. But of course. With Cassidy out of the picture, that put the other rookie, the guy who qualified alongside him, Norman Nato, into the lead, which was a very interesting scenario for the Rocket Venturi team. Although, like I said, that story does not have an entirely happy ending, unfortunately. No, it doesn't. We'll get to we'll get to Nato's race as well, but it also shows how well the Mercedes powertrain is performing um, with that in that Venturi. Um, Jack, I suppose, you know when you lux out you lux out and when you're down there you're down there um with Cassidy so you know obviously the Roland incident he takes attack mode and then just with that extra power tries to do a daring move on the inside and, and sends Cassidy into the wall and you you just feel for Cassidy because I feel like that's what happens when you're in Formula E it happen, I think it happens season upon season upon season you want to qualify at the front because if you know if you're in that midfield Right, they say when you're in the midfield in normal circuit racing that there's the potential for something to happen, right? But because it's circuit racing, you've got space. You know, sometimes that doesn't happen, and you're allowed to go through the track, and you're okay. But in Formula E, you know, if you find yourself down there, the chance of having an accident or something happen to you just escalate. And I think Cassidy was just caught up in that. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the thing with um, that's the thing with um, Formula E. Like some uh, sometimes, just the jury's just completely out for you. I think, um, and sometimes, and sometimes, just your luck turns. And and uh, and, and I think that we've seen that on uh, many many occasions before. I mean, like you can you can see you can see the switch between day one and day two back in Deary with Sam Bird. Sam was um, going um, mouth to mouth with. Um, uh, uh, Alex Lynn on day one, uh, sending both of them out the race, and then on day two he won it, and so, and so yeah, it's um yeah I think uh, yeah I think it was kind of disappointing for Nick Cassidy. I think there was a software issue which meant that when he did the braking he just spun out. Um, but yeah I I, I I but yeah it wasn't it wasn't just the fact that he was in group four that he got the pole position. Um, yes, it was a dry. Yes, it was a drying track in qualifying. I mean, like Lucas de Grassi in qualifying said, "Rome Formula E qualifying is in the wet. Is like trying to ice skate barefoot, balancing an angry cat drinking on t- uh, drinking hot tea on top of a baseball bat." And I've got no idea what that means. But <laughs> thank you, Lucas de Grassi, for that perfect explanation. That's quite an image. Um, and so, uh, uh, and so, yeah, it was. Um, uh, it was a difficult day. But yeah, this won't be his. Uh, this won't be his. Last thing he will come back from it. He has now got points on the board though, because he got those three points for pole position. Um, but he's going to be in Group Four again next time out. Who knows? Um, Valencia. There shouldn't really be a big difference between like the first four groups. But yeah, I think you you, you can. It, it is for all to see that the pace is there um, for him to go forward, and he will do good things in the future. Let's talk Nato then, finally. Obviously, he took the lead from that race, but then obviously lost out to Verline, um, Van Dorn, obviously, first, and then Alexander Sims. But towards the end of that race, running low on energy, um, and, and, you know, he he passes Verline, and you're like, oh, my God, Nato's going to get a podium, and he's like, Venturi, like, as I said, that confirmation that this Mercedes powertrain is good. I'm not saying that's the only reason why Venturi are up there. But you're like, you know, at least there, there's one rookie that's going to finish on the podium. He crosses that line. And we're all thinking, Nato's fine. Nato's fine. Because everyone was like, Eduardo Mortara, Eduardo Mortara. Like, he's run out of energy. Surely he's run out of energy. But he hadn't for some reason. Everyone thought, oh, he's gone. He's a goner. And everyone thought, oh, Nato, he's just crossed the line and it's hit zero. Yeah, he's good. But Jack, um, he runs out of energy. We, and you kind of know as soon as that you know, under investigation comes up, you feel like this is slam dunk and he loses that podium. Verline finishes in third. Um, what was your take on that? Yeah, I'm still very confused about the, uh, that because it looked like Nato was much better on energy than Edo um, by a good kind of like half a percent. Um, coming through like the final... 
uh, section, I could see that Mortara was already on 0.0, .0 whereas Nato was on 0 0.1, and I thought he got over the line with 0 0.1. But, um, yeah, I'm not sure whether that's experience from uh, Edo Mortara, where he's... Um, where he's where uh, where he knows what to do more or less when it comes over the line. Uh, Susie Wolf said after the race that they have this system in place to completely shut off when they're when they're when they've run out of power. However, they must have miscalculated um, how much that they were taking away from the um, from the safety car period, and it turned out that lots of lots of teams and drivers were tight on energy, but none more so the Venturi and. Um, if I'm completely honest, I feel like the wrong driver got disqualified from that. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, I'm clueless. Uh, for me, for me, Jack, I think it, it's what you said. It's that experience. Maybe Mortara realised and just knew what to do, and and maybe Nato was just so excited about potentially finishing, you know, on the podium that maybe he just used a bit too much power coming out of that final corner and didn't really lift him closer. Maybe powered across the line to celebrate that podium as you probably would normally do but that was the thing that stopped him from being on that podium and not you know recovering or coasting across the line to get that energy back um and that it could be something just as simple as that and whereas mortara was like okay i just need to coast and coasted across the line and recovered some energy back which allowed them to you know you know happy days and you know you finish the race and you don't get disqualified i think it's probably those fine margins that that could have done it for, for Nato. But then obviously, let's talk about the front. Ed, we had uh, Van Dorn, you know, in that lead, dominating that race. And then that, obviously there was a late safety car for the Rast's incident. And then he's had a, a sort of one lap uh, shootout with Alexander Sims, who managed to pass um, a really good day for Alexander Sims in the Mahindra. Um, but, you know, surely now with Van Dorn winning that race and, and seeing off that last lap battle with Alexander Sims that, you know, Mercedes have to be favourite now for this title, I feel. Well, they're not leading at the moment, Jaguar are. So, <laughs> in terms of, but in terms of raw pace, Mercedes do look like um, overwhelmingly. If they can get their act together and set out of trouble, then it's Van Dorn or De Vries that's going to be one right up there when we get to the last couple of rounds of the season, wherever they take end up taking place, of course, because the calendar hasn't been decided fully. But um, what was interesting was it sort of after NATO was you know dealt with by both Verline and Van Dorn, it was sort of a shootout between the two. And when Rene Rass crashed and caused that safety car you're referring to, Verline had just gone into attack mode at the Marconi Tower uh, corner, that sort of hairpin. Uh, and that was what really uh, caught them out, I think, uh, because uh, Porsche basically blew in attack mode. Uh, and we're really unlucky if things have gone just a little bit differently Porsche could have ended up winning both races with both their drivers if uh, Lotto had been a bit more patient and if uh, Verline had been a bit more luckier and then Verline to be honest was caught napping and a very satisfying moment for Dilbag Gill I believe because the uh, Sims uh, went right around the outside of Pascal Pascal who let's remember left the team early to go to Porsche so, um, and uh, he went right around the outside. It was a brilliant piece of opportunism by Sims. He just managed the race extremely well. Uh, obviously, he didn't have a great super pole, but he was able to, you know, still qualify in the top six and end up uh, making his way through the field up to second position and get his first podium for his new team. First time, of course, he's been on the podium since he won his first Formula E, Formula e race back in Duria the previous season at the beginning of season six. So, yeah, it was great to see Sims back in form because he looked like in his last couple of races at BMW he looked like someone who was just uh, a bit all forlorn, like nothing was working for him. And now he's back in a really good environment that seems to be suiting him quite well. And so, but yeah, as you say, your original question, it, it was a great recovery for Van Dorn, after, especially after the previous day, his car just being in the wall. And let's give full credit to Mercedes mechanics for putting that thing back together overnight because it looked properly smashed up at the end of race one a lot of carbon fiber on her own and had to be cleared up after both races unfortunately but yeah so i agree with you mercedes in the box seats and then finally jack just to to, to wrap up the show um porsche because as you as, as said there they could have won both races you know we're not looking at porsche and saying you know what they're the best they're they're up there we, we didn't even include them in in that top three we, they might just nip up there once or twice but Verline obviously said, and to be said, you know, when the race went green, on his 
on his steering wheel, was still saying full course yellow. So he doesn't understand why the race had gone green and his was still saying full course yellow. That's why he said he lost out to Sims because you know it still said it was yellow. So when he and, and, and that was as he was going past him, he was like, "Hang on a second, um, why am I still in full course yellow mode? Like, and why am I still having yellow flags showing?" Um, but Verlan was very interesting, and, and this is what I love about Verlan. He's incredibly honest. He says, "For some reason, at the start of the race, we're so quick." But then as the race goes on, our pace just disappears. And I said, I don't know where it goes. And he, he said he, he found it was it's something that he also moaned about at Mahindra, which I find interesting. But we've, I think we've seen that with Lotterer and Verline, that their pace is good to start off with. And then all of a sudden you think, you know, they could fight, they could fight. He was in this fight with Van Dorn, and all of a sudden he's back down in fourth. Like, it's, it's an odd one. Yeah, and yeah, and I think it's... Uh, and. I do see that because because just as uh, just as you're asking that question, I was also thinking back to Diria where he started on the front row, and I'm pretty sure he ended sixth or seventh. I think in that race, I'm pretty sure he went backwards. But um, but uh, yeah, it's um may, maybe that's the thing that Porsche need to uh, need to fix. Um, either that or or if with Verline it it. Uh, it if if it happened at Mahindra and it's happening at um Porsche, then maybe he does still need to adjust his driving style uh, in there. Remember, he is. I mean, like this is his third seat. Well, I mean, like he missed half of last season, but um, but this is technically his third season in Formula E, so he is still, you know, slowly getting there. And I think now, I think now he's in this factory Porsche team. He will develop even more and become an even better driver, but there may still be some of the uh, uh, because because obviously racers instinct you, you you want to break at the final section you don't want to lift in coast and that kind of stuff so and uh, and so yeah that is something that I a lot of drivers need to learn when they go into Formula E and maybe that's something that maybe Pascal hasn't adjusted to yet but if it's happening with both Porsches then yeah maybe. Uh, maybe have a look at the software, see um, see see what they can do to try and tweak that a bit. Yeah, I think it's interesting because uh, Pascal Verlaine to me is, is is has got so much potential, and you know, I I I kind I want him to do well because I feel like he did well at Mahindra. He sort of deserves this chance at Porsche, and you know, I I love that he's down to earth. That's one thing I I, I love about Verlaine from speaking to him, from interviewing him, and. You know, it's just really interesting to see why he's struggling and, and, and why Porsche is struggling as well. And I think that's kind of a, you know, Mercedes doing what they're doing right now. It's not a good look for Porsche. Porsche need to maybe find something to try and be a bit more consistent and a bit more up there. But boys... I think that's a little harsh, can I just say, Jack? Because it's on. only Porsche's second season in Formula E. Mercedes had that year as HWA beforehand, so they got a little bit of an advantage and yes, but then you could also argue that Porsche were monitoring Dragon, and you know, well, we know who that, that didn't really thing. work out. It didn't out. go work out very well, but they were, you know, putting their noses in. It's that's a bit like quite BMW a, were yeah. Vandrade. <laughs> Speaking of which, we didn't talk about BMW very much. But Gunther, I thought, did a good job across both races because we said they needed to score some points, get their season underway again. Gunther, fifth in the second round, nearly got uh, collected the back of Mortara, unfortunately, when Mortara had a crazy moment near the end. And then, of course, we saw Bird, De Vries, and Roland all go off into the runoff area, and Bird's and De Vries' race ended. The the two championship contenders basically crashing into one another, and De Vries, I think, just admitted that he just lost it really early, and Bird, I think, just got collected in there. And Roland was quite lucky to be able to continue, frankly, after what was quite a up and down and quite, like I said, quite a messy weekend for Roland. But yeah, I thought we should just cover that at the end because otherwise it would feel yeah. a bit of a no, remiss. Free, Still free, bottom of the, the championship, though. Yeah, that's the thing with BMW. Like, they look slow. I'm going to be honest. Like, BMW, I think, are the slowest... Um, well, not the slowest team, but one of the slower teams. Like, Gunther being two seconds off in that drying qualifying session, going backwards in the race. The car looks incredibly hard to drive. Um, you know, they're not getting anything out of it. And you, you can sort of see that it's their last season. I feel like you can sort of see it. Uh, so BMW um, you, giving up, that's what you're yeah, implying. Yeah, I, I feel like you can sort of see that it's their last season. And, you know, they're just... They're, well, why would you spend money on something that you know you're leaving? Like, I don't think that powertrain has massively improved since season seven, season six, sorry. Um, and, and maybe that's something... Maybe that's a talking point for another day is 
you know, how how have BMW actually moved from season six to season seven, knowing that they're leaving? Like, why would you, why would you commit? Why would you spend throw money at something that you're going to do something else in? There's, you might as well save the money, right? So, and then that might be pretty harsh on BMW side of things. And obviously Andretti is still there to race, and Andretti obviously will still be providing, you know, and helping BMW create the the car in in retrospect in areas. Okay, but obviously BMW provide the powertrain. But BMW is an interesting story for another day. Um, but boys, we have run out of time. Um, Ed, Jack, um, huge pleasure as always. Yeah, I agree. Pleasure as always. Yeah, it was great to talk about it. And uh, yeah, so much, so many things happen in Rome. It's impossible to cover all of them, but I think we did a pretty solid job. What about you, Pico? Yeah, no, interesting weekend. Two weeks time to Valencia. Can't wait. Indeed, two weeks time and we do it all again. Another double header, but this time for the first time ever on an actual circuit. I believe Mexico is an actual circuit. For yeah, me, me too. I was just about to yeah. say that. <laughs> people, uh, but people are like, this is a proper actual circuit. It's Valencia. Oh, but like Mexico is. Monaco kind of also is as well. Um, but it's a street circuit. But uh, who knows? But um but we see what these cars actually are like without really any barriers. Because I suppose with Mexico, apart from the start line, there are a lot of barriers around. Um, and not too much runoff. Whereas Valencia, there's going to be tons. Um, but we're there for two weeks, so we'll be back next week previewing, looking at all the news stories that have come out of any more news stories that have come out of Rome. Obviously, the freeze for that has taken a five-place grid penalty um, for Valencia for the first race. So that's sort of the main news that came out of the race um, over the last couple of days. Um, but yeah, we'll be back to preview Valencia and look at any of the talking points that have come out from Den. Thank you so much for watching the FEZ show. Please remember to, you know, hit the like button and subscribe if you are enjoying on any of your podcast apps that you're listening on or onto YouTube. Um, we are ever so grateful for every single like, comment and uh, subscription that you guys do on your various platforms that you listen to this episode on. Thank you so much and we'll see you soon. Bye.